I'm Lawrence Francis, host of Interpreting Wine, welcoming you to the Napa Valley Special Series 2023. Across these five episodes, we'll be exploring the Napa Valley scene through the lens of five very different wineries, giving us an incredibly detailed and up-to-date snapshot of this fascinating region via its people, land and winemaking. Make sure you subscribe to Interpreting Wine wherever you're listening so you don't miss an episode. We kick things off today in the company of Emma Swain of Sensupery Estate. We hear Emma's origin story and she introduces us to the St. Supery team before talking technology in the cellar, export markets, we get a Dollar Hyde Ranch virtual tour, Emma talks geological influences, introduces the Napa Valley Agricultural Preserve, e-notourism offerings, before previewing the premier Napa Valley tasting and auction. Enjoy. Well, uh, Lawrence, it's it's great to be here with you. And as you know, I was saying, I've been in the wine business now for thirty years, which is sort of shocking to me that it's kind of come along that that amount of time. But I was so fortunate that I was able to go to um, UC Davis for school and. You know, I enjoyed wine, but then when I realized uh, how close UC Davis was to Napa Valley and how beautiful it is here, I kept thinking, how do I end up living here? That was just kind of a, a, a focus for me, a, a goal in just kind of behind everything and also to to not be poor anymore because being a poor, starving student wasn't super fun. And uh, so I became a CPA and uh, I kept thinking, gosh, I really want to work in the Napa Valley and how do I end up there? And uh, one of the gentlemen I was working for asked me if I knew anyone who wanted to be a controller in the wine business. And I said, mm-hmm. well, me, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and he said, well, I can't take you. And I said, yes, you can, because I have another job offer. And uh, so he introduced me to Francis and Eleanor Coppola, and I went to go work for them when they had uh, Nibom Coppola. Coppola State Winery, which became Inglenook Winery Mm -hmm. um, later because I was part of that acquisition team that helped them purchase the Inglenook property. And so that was kind of my start in the wine business. And um, I've never left. I just I love it here in Napa Valley. And I I work across the street from from where I started my career, which is kind of fun because, you know, Napa Valley is a very small place and uh, and we're all very close to each other. But it's also um, really fun because it is a little tiny place and we get to all work together very closely. Amazing. And uh, I will, you know, I'll I'll, uh, expose my own ignorance. I I don't actually know what CPA stands for. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind just zooming in on that just a, a little bit for us. Yeah. So I studied agricultural and managerial economics and biology. So Mm -hmm. um, I became a certified public accountant, which is like a chartered accountant um, in other locations where you... um, do tax and audit and attest services and consulting services for businesses. And I worked with uh, small and emerging businesses and focused primarily on small companies that were getting ready to go public um, Mm -hmm. or uh, artists and agriculture as well. So that was kind of my focus as an an accountant. And uh, to pick up the story then, so presumably in, in in that role for a number of years, and uh, how did the transition go, I guess, and how did the story carry on? Yeah, so I worked for um, a wonderful gentleman, John Scutney, um, who has his own uh, winery now called Lang and Reed. And at the time he was running as the general manager, he ran the Nibom Coppola Estate Winery. And Scott McLeod was our winemaker and Tony Soder was our consulting winemaker. And the three of them shared so much knowledge with me every day. I'd ask a question and then suddenly I was in the cellar or out in the vineyard learning more and more about wine and it was a it was a really special time for me because I I learned a lot about sales I learned about a lot mm-hmm. about viticulture mm-hmm. and about winemaking and when I left uh, Nibam Coppola I went to go work for the Sebastiani family in Sonoma and at the time they were an 8 million case winery and I um, helped the family sell most of that property to uh, Constellation Wines and 
the winery then became very small, um, about a 300,000 case winery. And I became the chief operating officer at that point. And we sort of turned the winery around and became very just focused on Sonoma wines and making the very best wines we could from Sonoma County and had great uh, resources, hundreds and hundreds of acres of vineyard. And it was a lot of fun. And then we sold that winery um, at the end of uh, we sold it again at the end of 2008, and that's when I came to St. Supery to be the uh, chief executive officer here. And so I've been here for about 14 years now. <laughs> wow, incredible, incredible. Yeah. And um, I, I believe as well, um, well, you you also you know, told me in advance, you know, some of the, the sort of key, um, yeah, other other staff that you're working with there as well, who I believe also have, you know, reasonable a tenure as well in the company. Absolutely. So, you know, I um, I guess I developed a reputation for turning wineries around and selling them and um, and making a lot of change. I'm a little bit of a change junkie. And so when I um, came to St. Supery, um, unfortunately, the winemaker resigned. And um, about two weeks after I started, um, mm-hmm. nothing to do with me. And uh, he had another wonderful opportunity. And so I immediately kind of delved in and started interviewing a lot of fans fantastic winemakers and learning more about what we needed as an entity to do to improve our wine quality. And I did that with our VP of Viticulture at the time. And um, we brought back our former winemaker, Michael Scholes, who had established our uh, winemaking style for Sauvignon Blanc and created some of our top scoring wines over the years Mm -hmm. and created our Elu blend with uh, Michel Roland um, in the early 90s. So it was great to bring Michael back. And I did that in um, 2000. And he's been super instrumental, of course, in um, our wine quality, but also in our viticulture here at the winery. Michael grew up in the the Barossa Valley and is sixth generation um, Mm. on his family property in the Barossa and really knows and understands viticulture and winemaking. It's just how he grew up. And um, it's wonderful to have him leading that part of our team here at St. Supery. We've made a lot of changes and it's been really exciting to incorporate um, different technologies we've learned from around the world and from Napa Valley. And and they've influenced our properties here at St. Supery as an estate winery. It's mm-hmm. been pretty mm-hmm. wonderful. Mm-hmm. So Michael returned in uh, 2009 to St. Supery, and we immediately started investing in the cellar, and we brought in a lot of um, new technology. He started working with one of our key barrel makers, uh, Jean-Luc Sylvain in Saint-Emilion, and he and Jean-Luc started working on creating our own personal toast for our barrels, which makes up Mm -hmm. the majority of all of our barrels here in We've actually just been fine-tuning that and fine-tuning that um, until we were there together in 2016 with John Luke, and um, I think we've we've really finalized just a beautiful um, toast that we particularly like for our Napa Estate Cabernet Sauvignon. But also, you know, we've invested a lot in the cellar and new technology and um, visiting other regions and bringing you know, hand sorting, optical sorting, whole berry barrel fermentation, Mm -hmm. automating our pump overs, automating um, a lot of our technology um, and kind of making it uh, modern. I think the winery had a great layout and great tools and just bringing a lot of that modern technique to the cellar has really helped us elevate our wines. We um, only make wines from our two estate vineyards here in the Napa Valley, and our large estate vineyard is about 640 hectares, and about a third of that is planted to vineyard, and that's our Dollar Hyde Ranch, and it's just a, a really special place. It's like a valley within Napa mm-hmm. Valley. It's mm-hmm. a, a mountainous region, and you know, having those those mountain vineyards, like, you know, when you look in uh, in Portugal and Italy, you see these, you know, great terraces. Well, that's kind of what we have at, at Dollar Hyde. And having the ability to sort that fruit down to the berry for every single lot that we make mm-hmm. is exceptional. Mm-hmm. And that, that was a huge jump in quality for us starting in 2000 and um, 
12, we were finally able to sort every um, every berry from that property. And when you have a, a mountainous vineyard, you know, you can't turn the vineyard, right? You, you have to um, manage the viticulture and the canopy, but still every berry isn't perfect coming off the vine, but uh, we make sure it is when it's going into to fermentation. And so that's been a lot of fun for us and to improve quality with that. And of course, um, you know, blending and, and knowing our vineyards so well. You know, when I, I started in, um, in my career in Napa Valley, I mm -hmm. met a lot of great people like Al Bronstein, who uh, founded uh, Diamond Creek, one of my favorite wines here in Napa Valley. And Al was always very um, articulate with me that, Emma, the best way to make great wine is to be in a state winery because you have to control everything and um, you have to be able to improve that quality. And that's really stuck with me um, through my career that the, the best wines that wineries make are the ones that they have that control over, that they own those vineyards, yeah. that they yeah. make sure that they're they're doing everything. And so um, that's really important to us at St. Subri. And, um, and I think it's important to our ownership. You know, we're owned by um, Chanel and all of the Chanel wineries are estate grown, produced and bottled and um, very focused on, on maintaining that uh, control through everything that we do. When I started at St. Supery, um, we were owned by the Scali family. We'd been founded by the Scali family. And, you know, they'd been making wine in the south of France since 1920. And mm -hmm. they had an, a, a large export team. And our wines um, were sold by them around the world, but weren't a focus for them. And in my past job at Sebastiani, I also ran uh, the international sales for Sebastiani. And I have a lot of contacts all over the world. Um, and so one of the things I did early on was bring the sale of St. Supery wines back to St. Supery for export business. And mm -hmm. I know, Lawrence, you, you know that the wine business is a very small place, right? And it's wonderful that over the years we develop relationships with people all over the world who are our friends. It's a very small business and and the people are nice. I think that's why we all stay working yeah. in the wine business. It's not for the money and the fame. It's for the nice people that we get to to work with all over the world. And um, those uh, people help us sell our wines and, and tell our stories. So it's pretty wonderful. So I started um, by first bringing back Canada, which is an important market for us. Mm -hmm. Of course, our California wines are the number one wine sold in Canada. And um, going to uh, our friends there and and working with them, we work with um, some great uh, companies. Also, of course, the, um, the liquor boards in Canada. And then we have a sister company, uh, Ulysse Casabon, which is based in uh, Bordeaux, and they're a negotiant, and they bring our wines into um, France for us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, you know, most people pick up in Bordeaux, and we work um, with Pope in the Netherlands and Jeroboam's in the UK. And we've been with Jeroboam's for I think over 20 years now, and they're very familiar with our wines and carry four or five of our wines at, mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. times, which is, is great for us. But the Asia market is relatively new in the last, um, the last 14 years that we've been introduced there. And we have a wonderful business in Japan and South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, mainland China, Singapore. And a lot of that has to do with the reputation of Napa Valley in uh, the Asian markets. Um, Robert Mandavi was uh, at the forefront of bringing Napa Valley wines to Japan with both the Mandavi wines and Opus One. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. reputation for quality wines from this little tiny uh, valley in which we live, you know, we make four tenths of 1% of all the world's wine. So it's, we're a very small place, but we're known um, for our quality. And I think that's, uh, I put a lot of that at Robert Mandavi's feet for taking our Napa Valley wines around the world. And so it's nice to have had that uh, reputation also built for us. And our focus on quality wines is very important. And I think, um, meeting and being in great shops like Jeroboam's enables us to be available for people throughout the UK market. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, any UK uh, listeners are, you know, of course, invited to, to to taste along, and I think that you know that that's for me is will always be one of the most amazing things about uh, wine is that it preserves and, and and captures all of these stories that we're talking about, and I think you know all of the the inputs and the uh, yeah, the 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 sense of, of of place, I think, is um is, is something that you know we talk about a lot, and um, I think it's great to have the time to to kind of really explore that. And um, so, I'd I'd love to really pick up on something that you hinted at there, which has you know got me really intrigued, which is which is actually talking about the estate. So you know, getting a, a really a sense of what I call the the geography of the estate. You know that. That kind, that sense of, you know, get the little Google Maps man and pop him in the centre of the of the Dollarhide uh, Ranch, and you know, give, give us a sense of, you know, what is around us, and you know, by all means, you know, at this time of year, as we're we're recording in in December, and we're sort of in that in that post harvest, and um, yeah, and equally, you know, what what is what is uh, what is the property like in terms of the parts that are planted to vines, but also, you know, again, intriguingly, the the majority, which actually isn't. Yeah. So um, the Dollarhide Ranch is is like this valley within the valley. It's in the northeastern corner and it's high elevation. And, you know, you may not think, you know, 400 meters is, is high elevation, but for mm. us it is because in Napa Valley, you know, we're, we're very tiny, but we have this wonderful fog influence that particularly in the summertime comes right up the center of the valley and kind of cools mm. everything mm. off at night and is instrumental in that huge diurnal shift that we have. And at Dollarhide, we get the benefit of those cooling breezes coming up the valley, but we don't get the moderating effect of the fog. So we we get cooler at night mm-hmm. um, yeah. and significantly cooler during the, um, the growing season, um, particularly September and October, we can be 10, um, 15 degrees cooler Fahrenheit um, at night at Dollar Mm Height than we are at our Rutherford estate and about the same peak daytime temperatures. Okay. Um, We we see that. And at the dollar at the Rutherford estate where the winery is located, we're just about um 30, 40 meters above sea level. So very different soil type um and very different uh, wines that we grow here. At Dollar Height we grow all of our Sauvignon Blanc. We grow about 8 to 10% of all of the Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley on that one estate. And we have 44 different parcels of Sauvignon Blanc. We um, first planted Sauvignon Blanc in 1985 with uh, parcel 5C. And we had gotten some budwood from Joseph Phelps Winery that was clone one that was originally brought to California from Chateau de Chem in the, in the 1880s. Um, by the first minister of agriculture. And so that Sauvignon Blanc, of course, it was the first year. And so it's clone one, you know, very original. Uh And um, that's what we planted uh, parcel five. And then over 20 years ago, Michael Scholes, our VP of viticulture and winemaking, um, was tasting the fruit in that parcel to determine when to harvest. And he noticed um, some vines that were particularly expressive, particularly healthy, and he tagged those And we've been propagating those same vines on our property now that the majority of all of our Sauvignon Blanc is our own field selection of Mm -hmm. that clone one. And and it's different in different locations. You know, Napa Valley has half the world's soil orders, but and on Dollar Hide, we have seven different soil series and 13 variations. And so some of those soils will end up, even with this same field selection, getting much more of a, a green lime, mm. citrusy um, flavor. And in other locations where we have a loamier soil, we'll get more of those tropical fruits, a little passion fruit, a little bit of fennel, um, and and very different uh, by locations. And so with our Napa Valley Estate Sauvignon Blanc, um, it'll be a blend of all 44 parcels of Sauvignon mm-hmm. Blanc. So while it's from one place and 100% Sauvignon Blanc and stainless steel fermented, it's got layers of flavor because of the different parcels, the different aspects, the different soils that um, we experience on the property. And it's really, it's a delicious wine and it's, um, it's fresh 
and it's not sweet, of course, um, we ferment it completely dry, but it does have um, just those layers of um, tropical and stone fruit combined with the citrus flavors that we're all very familiar with, with Sauvignon Blanc. We also grow on the, the parcel, we have seven lakes at Dollar Height and these rolling hills and some flat ground even at that high elevation. And on the rolling hills, we grow red Bordeaux varietals because the soil is very different there. It's a shaley soil. Um, we'll find seashells because it was, uh, you know, even at uh, 400 meters, it used to be uh, at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> and so it's very interesting um, soil with very little topsoil. The, the berries are small. And as mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. high skin to pulp ratio gives you great flavor with our red wines. So we grow Cabernet Sauvignon, Petit Bordeaux and Malbec at the Dollar Hyde property. And then in Rutherford, we have this, um, we just have a couple of soil types and we have a very loamy soil mm -hmm. and the yeah. wines we grow here, we just grow red wines here, Petit Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc and Merlot. And the, they have a very fine grained tannin, a beautiful texture um, that the wines of Rutherford are known for. It's just that um, the fine grained tannin texture that's often referred to as that Rutherford dust and the elegance that we mm -hmm. get from the wines here. It's pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, I, as again, I think I, I mentioned before we started recording, you know, I, I have um, done quite a lot of coverage really for, for your neighbors to the north, uh, you know, including a, a trip to Oregon and a travel around the Willamette Valley. And then also um, coverage with the, um, with the guys up in Washington state as well. So um, I feel like this is a, a really nice way to sort of continue that, that journey south along that coast. And, um, you know, both of the, those regions I, I, I felt were, were quite attached really, and, you know, quite mindful of the geological history, which, you know, you've already started to, to kind of allude to there in terms of the, the differences in, in the, in the different, um, properties that you have and um i wonder if, if you know using indeed you know any of the the um the features that that there might be to the north as well but but equally the the the, the, the geological history that you you have there specifically in california maybe set a little bit of the scene as as in you know what are the, perhaps some of the larger geological forces that have gone into shaping those vineyards that you've mentioned there Right. So, I mean, we do have a lot of different soils because we have, you know, we've had the, the plates causing shifts. We've had the ice age causing, uh, you know, a lot of erosion of the, the hillsides. And we also have um, volcanic soils. So, mm -hmm. you know, we've mm -hmm. got quite a, a good range here in, in Napa Valley, which is pretty, pretty awesome to have that variety and the variety of elevations as well as uh, temperature throughout the valley with the, the cool um, breezes that we get coming in off the San Pablo Bay and then also coming off um, through the Sonoma Coast. So a great uh, diversity for a little uh, tiny place. It's, you know, um, 30 miles by five miles. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah. very small um, location, but but a lot of diversity that we have here, um, which enables us to grow a lot of different um, varietals. Mm -hmm. You know, at, we're mm -hmm. only in the eighth of the size of Bordeaux, but we grow so many uh, different varietals here because of all of the difference in aspect. You know, one of the things that that I think is really fantastic about the Napa Valley is um, the biodiversity of this location. And if you think about um, mm -hmm. biodiversity mm -hmm. being sort of red, um, if it's a hot spot and, and a, a picture of a map of the U.S., you'll see where we are in Napa Valley um, as sort of red and and radiating out to the coast as just a, a major hot spot as well as a little bit in Southern California. And as you go across the United States, it becomes completely white until you sort of hit, hit uh, Tennessee and the Everglades. Mm -hmm. And um, that biodiversity is super important in how we farm here in Napa Valley. You know, we we, of course, are certified Napa Green um, since 2008 in the, in the vineyards and wineries since 2012. And a lot of um, what we do and pay attention to is 
maintaining that vineyard and maintaining the biodiversity around it. So at Dollar Hyde, only a third of the vineyard is um, planted um, to vineyard, but we also have a little over 1,200 heirloom fruit trees. We've got 86 types of peaches, over 40 types of nectarines, Asian pears, pluots. Um, we have uh, a lot of wildlife and we encourage those wildlife mm -hmm. corridors and we also back up against a lot of public land and and so you know we have hundreds of bluebird boxes and and we try to maintain that balance um, so we don't have to you know take action I mean we're very fortunate to be in this Mediterranean climate zone where we're not having rain in the summertime and so we don't get as much disease pressure but mm -hmm. what we try we do is we look you know, with a microscope in the vineyard, it's like, oh, we have this pest. Do we have a balance? You know, it's all about balance and cover crops and encouraging um, that biodiversity throughout the property to have it live in balance and also to be respectful of this place because this place is incredibly biodiverse and and we want to keep that. And it's unique. Um, it's unique part of the United States. I mean, we have wildflowers that are only mm -hmm. on serpentine mm -hmm. soils in the northeastern corner of, of Napa and, and completely different wildflowers that you'll see down in Carneros. So it's, um, it's a wonderful place to, to encourage that and to be thoughtful about it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, uh, as well, you know, the, those are the, yeah, I like to think of the sort of the, the, the colors really with which, uh, the the winemakers and the viticulturalists are, are able to to paint really and and you know with using the using the uh you know essentially the the, the grapes as the as the transmission medium for for, mm -hmm. for for all of that activity for all of that biodiversity for all of that um you know geological um diversity as well and and you know actually having a a, a way to to translate that into into a, a wine and you know into a product that can travel around the world i think is you know still you know the, the the thing that amazes me the most about wine, um, but you know maybe just in 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 finishing off that point really, you know the I guess the the thing where my mind immediately goes, um, and I think it would be you know fascinating to 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 hear um, some some more about you know is actually that what you've just described there as an an attraction in and of itself and i guess the the importance of of enotourism and, and i guess yeah the, the the way that you know that that small incredibly diverse valley that you've described there though being such a huge magnet being such a, a huge draw to to people coming and uh, wanting to experience that for themselves yeah, we were very fortunate that um, we passed the Agricultural Preserve in the 1960s, and that um, halted development in Napa Valley. It really um, put a stop to a huge amount of development mm -hmm. and prioritized mm -hmm. agriculture. And you can look at pictures of uh, Silicon Valley from the same time frame of uh 1964 and 66 and today and see that there's just houses and here there's been very little development. I mean, living here, you think, oh, some things have changed, but really they've changed in the cities. We have a few more wineries, but we really um, have prioritized preserving this very special place. And many of us often say Napa Valley is a national treasure and it really is. And more than 90% of this valley is permanently protected. The land trust of Napa County has more than double the acreage, just the, and many organizations protect the valley, but the land trust of Napa Valley has more than double the acreage of what we have in vineyards, mm -hmm. um, permanently protected. And um, whether that's as conservation easements or, um, or permanent preserves, but they've prioritized um, biodiversity, view shed, and wildlife corridors and really worked hard at that. But then in addition to that, we have the strictest environmental laws on planting a vineyard of anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we, we are not allowed to plant over a 5% slope without a permit, and there, we're no longer allowed to plant over 30%. And so that's really changed the, the landscape in the valley to not being able to develop much more vineyard. There's redevelopment going on, but there's very few new vineyards 
available for development in Napa Valley um, at this point. And only 9% of Napa Valley is planted to vineyard. When you you drive up the, the center of the valley and you come through Rutherford, you think, oh, there's a lot of vineyard, but actually there's a lot of open space, which mm-hmm. is pretty, pretty wonderful. Yeah, it's a, a huge, a huge surprise to me as well. And, uh, you know, even, um, you know, down in, in the in the city, uh, you know, of Los Angeles, you know, I, I, I was, you know, visiting there a few years ago, and, you know, expected this kind of urban sprawl. And, you know, really, it, it didn't, it never appeared, you know, it was, it was very much you know, you leave the city and uh, and everything is you know very green and uh, yeah very natural. So I can I can kind of only imagine um, what it's like there. And you know, for you in terms of you know, I know you know we're end of twenty twenty two, and uh, you know, I'm sure there's there's been a a huge disruption to the you know the ability to 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 have people there and to you know to to invite them there you know over the last two years or so. But I'm just curious as to you know how has that offering recovered really um, kind of post pandemic and, and uh, yeah, what, what might people expect if they were to, to, to go and visit? Well, you know, I think Napa Valley is one of the greatest places in the world to visit. And I, I, I travel all over the world and I think, oh, here I am in another beautiful place. But then when I come home, I'm so happy to be home. And, you know, as I drive up the valley and I've lived here for, you know, 30 years, I often will stop as I'm pulling into the winery and take a photo. I did it just this morning because the sun was coming up and it was so spectacular. Um, You know, I live in a really beautiful place and I I encourage uh, you to plan a visit and include some uh, hiking. We've got lots of great parks and places to be outside, fantastic restaurants, um, and great venues for for local music, and um, really, it's just a beautiful place to to stay and play, um, and really enjoy yourself and and be relaxed. I think one of the big changes with um, COVID, or or perhaps kind of more enforced, is wineries really requiring um, reservations to visit, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but also um, providing a more intimate and and wonderful decadent experience for you when you're here. And, you know, perhaps in the in the old days, you would try and hit as many wineries as possible. And now it's more savor, sip and experience. Mm, um, mm, mm. Uh, you know, the, the where we are with the winery, um, you know, I've planted another 90 trees on this property. And it's, it's just a super pretty place because again we're trying to encourage the the biodiversity i can look out my window of my office and right now i can see a fat little bluebird perched right there <laughs> and um but i can see usually 10 or 12 different um species of birds you can hear them just singing um outside and that's one of the nice things about covid is um in napa valley we have much more uh outdoor experiences mm-hmm, that the mm-hmm, county mm-hmm. county has allowed us to do more outdoor tastings than we were allowed to do previously um, because of our strict uh, rules on development. And so it's been nice to have people outside and inside um, and tasting, you know, food that we grow here on the property um, with our wines and and just uh, being able to enjoy in a very, you know, relaxed and uh, and fun way. Yeah, I love it. Uh, And yeah, that you know, sip, sip and savor. I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal that. I think, <laughs> that, you know, that that's. I think just naturally, you know, even even going to a a wine tasting. You know, I, I you know, I find myself, uh, you know, interested and in, and in, and lucky enough, really, you know, to 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 go to a lot of tastings, and I I just you know have naturally gravitated towards that sip and savor approach. You know, when you when you you know try all of a winemaker's wines. You know, it's still I still see them getting taken aback sometimes when they say, oh, you know, which, which wine do you want to try? And I say, you know, you can try all of them because, you know, what are you going to, what are you going to spend, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes maximum probably with, with that, with that winemaker. And, but, you know, having all of those wines and, you know, them being able to actually not just pick one of the wines or, you know, one of the colors from the palette, but then, you know, actually bring these together and talk about different, planting regimes talk about different sites talk about different varieties you know you, you I think that's the way you really get a, 
a full picture. So yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, great that you know people are are, are going slower basically in that, and they're not they're not racing themselves. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to enjoy here in Napa Valley. And, you know, we have fantastic restaurants, great spas, wonderful hotels, great wineries. And most of all, we have great people. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it so- sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> sounds terrible. But yeah, it, um, it sounds absolutely incredible. And I think, you know, in, in closing, really, you know, I, I would... Uh, yeah, I'd like to to look ahead, really, because uh, you know I know that you're going to be visiting uh, the UK in, in in February of next year, and uh, yeah, I, I feel like that is certainly something that I, I'd like to share with the listeners, um, and uh, yeah, to to kind of introduce them to yeah that trip and I guess the the mission behind it, and uh, yeah, what 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 you are and and the other Napa Valley vintners are looking forward to next year. Absolutely. So I will be back in London February 9th and 10th and hopefully doing um, some fun events. We're going to be promoting our premier Napa Valley uh, tasting. Premier Napa Valley is an auction that we do just for trade every year. And that auction is about 200 barrel lots. They range from five to 20 case lots. The wines are completely unique. And it's really an opportunity as as vintners and and winemakers to um, compete with our neighbors to make the very best wine we can. And in this very small, unique environment, and I know that... um, We've had some buyers from the UK, so some of these wines have ended up in in Harrods, and um, you'll see them uh, throughout the the UK, these very small lot wines. If you look for that premier Napa Valley label, you know that there's um, really only 60 to 240 bottles of that wine ever made, and um, it's the very best that we can do, and, and we love Premier Napa Valley. It helps to um, promote and protect the Napa Valley name, the mm-hmm. proceeds mm-hmm. from the auction. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's a lot of fun to, to taste those wines. They're truly exceptional and um, just an example of what we can all do. And it's fun to travel with my fellow vintners because we all enjoy being together and we all enjoy drinking each other's wines. <laughs> Um, but also to be back in London, um, again, I come a, a few times a year and um, love the opportunity to do wine dinners and, and tastings um, around around London. Amazing. And I'll be uh, yeah, sure to um, include um, yeah, details of, of Premier Napa Valley and uh, any details that I can share about uh, that trip as well, because I think that's that's Absolutely. always interesting to give people a chance to to meet the guests and to and to taste the wines, which is uh, yeah. F- until now, it's something that we can't quite put through exactly on the on the podcast. But um, just really then in, in closing, Emma, I just you know invite you to share where my listeners can track you down online, and you know where's the where's the the best place for them to find you. Absolutely. So you can check us out at saintsupery.com, S-T-S-U-P-E-R-Y.com. That's Saint Supery is our website, but also um, our YouTube channel has lots of great chef demonstrations and videos of our winemaking um, techniques. If you want to see an optical sorter in action or automatic pump overs, just check it out on YouTube or follow us on Instagram or Twitter, um, hashtag Saint Supery. So thank you so much for having me, Lawrence. A huge thanks to Emma Swain of Sensupri Estate. It was an absolute pleasure to have you kicking off the series in style. Please do help to amplify this episode and the series by sharing the direct link, which is interpretingwine.com slash 489. You can also find links to all episodes from the series in the description below. Next time on the Napa Valley series in episode 490, I'll be speaking with John Rule of Trefethen Family Vineyards. So make sure you're subscribed to our Interpreting Wine podcast to be alerted when the episode goes live. See you then.